Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. As we attempt to navigate the noisy political rhetoric and bombast that surrounds us these days, there's always a welcome respite in music. For young people, mastery of the music of the masters could well be the path to greater civility in public life and public discourse, which is where inter-school orchestras of New York comes into play. Since 1972, the program has given thousands of school children the opportunity to study orchestral instruments and to perform in orchestral settings, bringing the universal language to them and their audiences. Karen Gear, the program's new executive director, brings a rich musical as well as managerial background to its mission as it enters its 45th anniversary season and she'll tell us about the workings of the organization and what riches it has in store for us in the days ahead. Welcome. Thank you. Karen, I was reading your bio and you're a real Renaissance woman. <laughs> you know, you've been a, a performing musician, a music teacher, you've been a practicing attorney, and you've done a lot of work heading nonprofits in the arts. Who or what influenced you towards music? Well, uh, my mother. My mother did. She was an alto in the choir when she was growing up, and my father played trombone and uh, Tommy Dorsey and other orchestras, and they encouraged me to be, mu to be musical. And uh, they really believed in music, that it helped expression and would help me socially, and it really turned out to be a great thing. So I assume you took music lessons as a child. Yes, I started when I was in fourth grade with the band at school on trumpet. Okay, um, and you progressed, you learned a, a number of different instruments, right? Yes, so my father worked for General Electric and we moved from place to place. And um, I started on the trumpet because the band directors needed trumpets. And then when I moved to the next place, they needed uh, trombone, so I played trombone. And then they needed a baritone horn at the next place. And finally, I ended up on the tuba. Wow. Uh, it's, it's interesting, you know, like when I was growing up and studying the piano, because girls are supposed to play the piano, <laughs> girls were not supposed to play the big brass instruments. We're not supposed, they didn't play the trumpet, they didn't play the trombone, they didn't play the saxophone, they certainly didn't play the tuba, because it was not considered feminine. Uh, has that changed? It has changed. Uh, women are now playing brass instruments in uh, professional orchestras, and certainly we see children playing uh, uh, girls playing all kinds of brass instruments and band and orchestra. Did you ever harbor ideas about um, a career, having a career as a professional musician? Yes, I wanted to be a professional tuba player for many years because I wanted to show that women could do the same things as men did. And I practiced very hard. I practiced four hours a day at Kent State and at Manhattan School of Music. And I entered competitions and I won concerto competitions and I was able to play Tubby the Tuba with orchestra. And eventually I did play professionally in pickup groups and brass quintets. It was, it was a wonderful experience. You also taught. Yes, I taught at the Diller Quayle School of Music, preschool music, and then I moved on to be the music director at the Ethical Culture School in Manhattan. And I taught band, and I taught uh, choir, and I taught general music with uh, little ORF instruments that had uh, xylophones. Okay. Was it, had you decided that a, a professional career that it was going to be too hard, or? No, what? I just... I just realized that I wasn't good enough, honestly. Uh, when I was at Kent State in Ohio, I was really high up on the chain, and then I came to Manhattan School of Music, and I was like, wow, these people are fantastic. And uh, I fit into the spectrum, but I really wasn't at the highest level. So then um, law school, how did law school come into play? Well, when I was a teacher, I uh, temp during the summer, and I met a lawyer uh, that uh, I was at a law firm and he really encouraged me to be a lawyer because I found mistakes in briefs and I was able to do research and he really trained me and also at Ethical there was a collective bargaining unit and I really wanted to become more adept at understanding those issues and so the school sent me to a collective bargaining uh, labor class at Columbia University and the professor was very encouraging 
So I applied to Fordham Law School, which was right around the corner from Ethical, and I would work from 9 to 3, and classes started at 4, and I would go there from 4 to 10, and uh, that's how I got my degree. Okay. And you practice law for a yes, period. Yes, I practiced at uh, Lester Schwab, Katz and Dwyer, and then Harris Beach. I was a toxic tort attorney and an environmental law attorney. I represented uh, different companies, and uh, it was a really great way for me to pay back my student loans. So what made you decide to move from the practice of law into nonprofits that focused on music or on the arts? So we worked at Two World Trade Center on the 85th floor, and when uh, the firm was destroyed, I really had a, a catharsis and I really wanted to go back to music and I stayed at the firm for a few years to help rebuild it but then I realized that I wanted to go back to my heart and I wanted to go back to help children and so I worked with a specialist Alexandra Duran who specializes in helping lawyers and other people find new careers and we went through a vigorous process and I was able to get a job at Opus 118 Harlem School of Music in East Harlem because there was a person there, Lee Kuntz, who really believed in me. Mm -hmm. So tell me, you did, you did a lot of work with music in Harlem, right? Yes, uh, I worked at Opus 118 and we were able to go to the Children's Inaugural Ball in Washington, D.C. for Obama's inauguration. Was Opus 118 the group where the children played the violin or was it a mixed group? Uh, when I started it was mixed, but mostly it was violin. And Roberta Guaspari started that group uh, at CPE 1 and 2. And sh they made a movie about her, Music right, of the Heart. with Meryl Streep. With Meryl Streep. And she was dynamic and just really great to work with. You were also executive director, before you got this job, I believe, uh, executive director of the Brooklyn Con Conservatory of Music. There are a lot of mu places where you can study music in, in New York City. Uh, I had not heard of the Brooklyn Conservatory. I don't know why Brooklyn shouldn't have a conservatory. Queens probably has one, too. Uh, but you've got, I mean, you, from Juilliard to Manhattan, the Manhattan School of Music, Manus, the Harlem School of the Arts, the Lucy Moses School on 67th Street, Marymount Manhattan College. It's really um, a place where if you want to get involved in music, you can do it. How is, um, uh, so, the Interschool Orchestras was started in 1972. Uh, how was it started and by whom and why? Well, it was started by Annabelle Prager and she did it for her son Jonathan because she really wanted him to play an orchestra. And at that time there were really no orchestras in New York City. So she started it with a lot of parents and they started... For children, for young... Yes, for children, right. I'm sorry. Right. And, uh, uh, there were 20 kids in the first orchestra, and uh, it was headed by a professional conductor, later Jonathan Strasser, and over the period of 45 years, now it has seven orchestras and one symphonic band, and we have about 325 kids right so now. So tell me about those, those seven orchestras and the band and the different ensemble groups. Well, it's a tiered system, so we pride ourselves in being able to take a kid from six years old and bring them in a beginning orchestra and then putting them in an intermediate orchestra and then finally to a group that plays almost professionally. At times they sound like a professional group. And uh, we uh, give about $250,000 in financial aid and no child is ever turned away because of financial need. The board of directors is very uh, determined and very committed to making sure that they keep up with that mission. So it runs from, what's the age range? In from your, 6 to 19. From 6 to 19. So it's tiered by age and by performance ability. Right, they all audition. They have, uh, they do a prepared piece and scales and uh, they do sight reading, which is very challenging where they get an orchestral piece and then they have to read it in front of a, a panel. And then based on their scores and availability of seats in the orchestra, they're moved from orchestra to orchestra. So the children 
so to get accepted, everybody would have, ha it sounds like everybody would have had to have, have had some musical training before they got to you. Yes, because you have to be able to sight read. You ha well, you have to be able to read. You don't have to necessarily be able to sight read, uh, which is sight reading is being able to see a piece of music and p playing it almost perfectly on the first try. But these kids have to read music, and some of the ways that kids learn music is by ear, and uh, we want them to be able to read with, with some proficiency, but they get that as they practice. Do they come from schools, public schools, private schools, wherever? They come from private schools, from public schools, from charter schools. We represent uh, every district in uh, Manhattan, kids from uptown, kids from downtown, uh, you know, everywhere. And how, lar how large are the ensembles? Uh, between uh, 30, 15 to 30 kids to 65 kids. And your focus is on classical music? Yes, primarily classical music, but they do play some jazz arrangements and they do play popular music. And over the course of the 45 years, they've performed with all types of musicians. And how about the band? Is it sort of traditional band music, John Philip Sousa kind of thing or not? Well, Brian Warsdale makes sure that the kids play all kinds of music from Christmas carols and Christmas arrangements to jazz music to the top band repertoire. Okay, we're going to have to take a short break and then we'll be back with more with Karen Gear, Executive Director of the Interschool Orchestras of New York after this message. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York, and I'm talking with Karen Gear, the Executive Director of the Interschool Orchestras of New York. So tell me about your, your staff, your conductors, your teachers, your coaches. Well, I'm very lucky to work with uh, professional conductor Jeffrey Grogan, and we co-lead the organization because he handles artistic and I handle executive and there's a lot of collaboration between us so he gives opinions on executive and I get a, give him opinions on artistic and we really work well together. Then we have uh, the rest of the conductors who are all professional conductors and music educators. Uh, one of the conductors, no, two of the conductors were actually ISO alum and came through the program and now they're giving back and they're teaching and conducting. We have professional musicians that are coaches that sit in the sections and give extra instruction to the kids. And um, I have a staff of four and most of them handle programmatic details. Is this a, um, in terms of a, of a child's participation, is this a year-long program? Does it correspond with, to the school year? Yes, it's, it's basically from September to May. The kids practice one time a week and maybe more before an important concert. Okay. Um, so once a week, um, is this after school? Is it on the weekends? No, it's after school between Monday and Thursday. Okay. And what's the program's sort of routine in terms of rehearsals, coaching, rehearsals, performances? So uh, they perform about 18 community concerts. Uh, so each orchestra gets about... Each ensemble? No, each ensemble gets a two. Okay. So it's a total of 18 community concerts. And they perform at Symphony Space. And this year on May 11th, they're performing at Carnegie Hall, all the ensembles. Together. To Is this the first time at Carnegie Hall? No, they do it about every five years. Okay. And, and the Symphony Space event, is that all of the ensembles together or...? Well, it's each ensemble plays by itself. So there's uh, some that play on the first night and some that play on the second night. And at Carnegie Hall, each ensemble plays by itself. Okay. So uh, everybody gets to hear the progression of the ensembles. And your, your top ensemble, what is that called? ISO Symphony. Okay. And the kids really aspire to be in that group. And what, what age? That's the 16, 17, 18? What? Yeah, mostly teenagers. Okay, okay. Um, the, I would imagine that the concerts at Carnegie Hall must pre be pretty exciting. Oh, the they're kids. very exciting. <laughs> 
They're very exciting. Last year they played at Jazz at Lincoln Center and that was kind of the prelude for the Carnegie Hall concert and it was it was so beautiful. I, I cried at places because mm -hmm. the music was so beautiful and it's so touching to see children express themselves and to do the best that they can do in these performances. Some of your musicians went to Scotland last summer? Yes, uh, sometimes we tour with the group. Uh, we, we try to do it about every other year and take a group to, uh, to Europe mostly. Would these be different ensembles that go or? Mostly the ISO Symphony okay. and some kids that need to fill in the spots. Okay, so in 2014 to 2015, you had, as of then, you had 350, 351 participants, which is a record number. Right? Yes. Uh, and I would imagine that for a city the size of New York, I mean, that tells me that it's probably really hard to get into one of your ensembles. Well, it's not hard. It's just that ISO is really not known. And the reason that we're trying to get the word out is that we really want more kids. In fact, Jeffrey's plan is to double the size of the organization in five years, a very ambitious plan. Uh, you know, there's a lot of organizations like community music schools that have their own orchestras, but we offer the complete package with brass and winds and percussion and strings. And when there's 65 kids in an ensemble, you know, it just sounds so great. And they're able to do complete works. Mm -hmm. What are the costs of being in the program? Well, the costs range because we give so much financial aid, but right now it's about twelve fifty for tuition and a five hundred dollar concert fee. But you know, we give out two hundred fifty thousand dollars in financial aid to make sure that no one is turned away. Where does the money come for uh, your program? Because you have a budget of cl close to a million, close to a million dollars. Yes, close to a million dollars. So thirty eight percent comes from earned income and the rest is raised. And I have to tell you that the board of directors is mostly responsible for making sure that that program runs each year. Now you do get some money, I believe, from the city, the state? Yes, we get money from the Department of Cultural Affairs and from the New York State Council of the Arts. Mm -hmm. Do most public schools these days offer opportunities for for young people to learn to play instruments? Or to... It's mostly specialized school, but Mayor de Blasio has a plan to really increase the arts and music in schools. But we see that not a lot of kids are playing instruments because it's, it's difficult. Kids are into their, their iPhones and their computers, and uh, instrument playing is a long-term process, and you really have to be patient. What advice would you give to, say, a 10-year-old who is curious about learning to play an instrument, but whose parents may not be pushing it? I would say that you should listen to classical music and really try to learn uh, what instrument you're interest, interested in by the sound of it. And, uh, go to a community music school fair and bring your parents to see uh, what kind of instrument you would like. I know that Third Street Music Settlement is a great place to try out instruments and to talk to people about starting instruments and, you know, take your parents to concerts. Tell them that you're really interested in concerts and, you know, just show your enthusiasm. How do, how, how do parents hear about you? Is it schools recommend you? Who, who, Right, right now, <laughs> right now it's word of mouth primarily. Okay. But uh, we're we work with private teachers to try to get them to recommend their students, and of course the coaches recommend students. Okay. What would you say are the the primary goals of the primary mission of the interschool orchestras? Well. <laughs> I think that music is a universal language and why my daughter was in music is because I wanted her to express herself and to feel beauty. And there's different pieces of music that evoke feelings. So like Barbara Adagio for strings evokes sadness and a Tchaikovsky piece would evoke power. And these children get to work together and to experience these feelings as they play and then 
they become more complete human beings. Of course, there's the side benefits of concentration, focus. Discipline. Discipline, being able to uh, work on your own. But I think these are side benefits from what music really offers. After 44, how many years have you, is it 40, this is your 45th year yes. that it's been in operation. I would think some of your graduates have, would have gone on to become professional musicians. Yes, uh, this year we're honoring two of them. Uh, most, uh, Tito Munoz, who is the director of the Phoenix Symphony Orchestra, and Chris Coletti, who is the trumpet player in the Canadian Brass. And although many of our students go on to be professional musicians, conductors, and music educators, the primary goal is for students to graduate from high school and to go on to college. And I was talking to some students the other day, and they want to be doctors. And there are students that want to be teachers and lawyers and music. They become lifelong learners of music and also patrons of the arts. And so that's, we're a community organization and that's what we're really striving for. How much interest is there in classical orchestral music these days? I had heard that attendance was down at, you know, symphonies, but I don't know, is that true or not? Yes, it's true, and one of the roles that youth orchestras play in this country is developing audiences for these for orchestras, and that's really important. And I think that classical music is somewhat misunderstood, and that if people can get back to uh, classical music as what it makes you feel, and instead of trying to analyze it or feel that it's an academic exercise. And so uh, orchestras are programming uh, material that's very powerful now uh, to try to bring back audiences. Do you still play the tuba? No. <laughs> no, I don't. I stopped a, a couple years ago uh, because the demands of being in nonprofit management are so great. But I do sing. I, I did study singing, and I'm, I'm studying with Renee Manning, and I'm learning to sing jazz. I was an opera singer for many years. Oh, really? Yeah, I sang opera. I studied, and I sang in... Uh, and various uh, pickup operas, and I was the soloist at the First Unitarian Church for about 20 years. Okay. Um, you just became executive director this season. What are your goals, I mean, your, your priorities for this 45-year-old program? Well, I'd like the organization to perform at higher profile venues, so we're looking to perform at the Oculus, and we performed at Flushing Town Hall, and our kids in the concert orchestra were the first orchestra to play at a Nets game. Really? Uh, first orchestra ever, and they got on and they played. Was this the band, or was this the... No, it was uh, the concert orchestra that played. Okay. And we're going to play at the Met Museum next year, and the Brooklyn Museum. And we're just really excited to try to find some new places. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, I want to increase the visibility of the orchestra, and I want to work with Jeff to do more cross-genre opportunities with other types of musicians and dancers. And uh, we're also looking to the future to try to build the organization to double its size. Ah, okay. What are the when you talk to the kids? Um, what do you? What's that, that, I think it would be rewarding to see what they're getting out of it. What do they tell you? Well, they, they tell us that they're learning how to be their best and that their conductors get the most out of them and that they're really motivated to do something special and to play their part at the highest ability that they can. Okay. It's, you know, I had not heard about the program before. Uh, and now I know about it, and it sounds great. Thank you. <laughs> We're out of time. I want to thank Karen Gear, Executive Director of the Interschool Orchestras of New York, for joining me. If you'd like more information, go to their website at isorc.org. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy.
If there are any people you'd like to hear from or topics you'd like us to explore, please let us know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.